Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk together today. It's an honor to be speaking with such a distinguished panel. Um, I have the task of discussing step up VARD, uh, video assisted retrosperitoneal de debridement, versus laparoscopic transgastric necrosectomy versus endoscopic necrosectomy, which well, to be honest with you, is a, is a difficult task, uh, because in the end, I, I think that in my mind, these are different procedures that may be useful for different, in different patient clinical situations, and perhaps even in, uh, in different centers diff uh, based on your local resources and your expertise. So really, in the end, I would like to discuss all of these together, because I don't think that there's a clear winner here from all of these procedures, uh, uh, so to speak. So I do not have any uh, disclosures. So <clears throat> one of the things about speaking third on a panel is that uh, there will be some overlap with what uh, the previous panelists have discussed. So perhaps this is just to reinforce the ideas so maybe we all learn a bit better. So pancreatitis is a, is a, is a significant disease, costs a lot of money, incidence is increasing, and the mortality is significant. Necrotizing pancreatitis occurs in about 15%, and infected pancreatic necrosis is the most important determinant of fatal outcome. And in terms of acute pancreatitis, uh, surgery for acute pancreatitis, infected necrosis used to be considered an absolute indication for urgent surgical debridement. Uh, and it remains al along in the setting of organ failure, the main indication for surgery. But it's no longer an absolute indication for surgery at this point in time. And I think that that has been addressed uh, by the previous panelists. Um, so what do we mean? So we used to, in terms of open debridement, surgery, for, this used to be surgery for acute pancreatitis, and in certain centers it still is. Uh, it has significant morbidity, as you can expect, typically done through a bilateral subcostal incision, uh, opening up the, open up the, the, retroperitoneal, the retroperitoneal space either, you know, inframesocolic uh, and, and through the gastrocolic ligament. Um, large amount of morbidity, of bleeding complications, and the mortality is also quite significant. And this actually, this study is already, already presented, once again, just to reinforce that there in, in, this is a, a large study of a combination, uh, this is a, a large study that uh, stratified high risk uh, and intermediate risk, low risk patients with pancreatitis, and the patients with high and very high risk benefited from a mortality standpoint. So we do have s some data that shows that MIS techniques are beneficial from a mortality standpoint, from a survival standpoint. Therefore, really should be uh, considered our standard of care. So because of all of this, uh, other techniques have been developed and become increasingly popular. And I, I say MIS in quotations because not all of these are surgical. Percutaneous drainage, uh, laparoscopic, transperitoneal laparoscopic approach, video assisted retroperitoneal necrosectomy, laparoscopic transgastric, transgastric endoscopic. Uh, these are all available techniques that are currently in the literature and that are currently being practiced in addition to uh, open approach. So once again, this has been discussed already. The, this study by Freeney was uh, presented uh, very, very well by, the, by the, the previous speaker. Therefore, I don't think I really need to get into it. But just to, the reason I'm presenting this is because this is really, uh, as it used to be an, an adjunct for open necrosectomy for residual collections, it kind of developed into a primary treatment for uh, infected necrosis. And in terms of a systematic review the, in 2012, the success rate is, is high in and around 50%. So 50% of patients can be treated, treated with just drains alone, and the mortality is, is acceptable considering the disease process. And this is, and this is, the, uh, the, this is the, the, the study that really introduced me to, uh, to, the, to, to step up to VARD um, and most of the surgical population. Um, so just so for everyone to, to understand what, we, what we're talking about when we're talking about a step-up approach. The step-up approach means that <clears throat> a percutaneous drain is, is placed first with the left retroperitoneal approach preferred as this is the, the, the preferred approach to then subsequently do a VARD procedure, the video-assisted retroperitoneal debridement. And I, I think that you can kind of get from this that, uh, that the this, that the, that the, the part, one of the, the, the benefits of doing this is that there's a delay, that, they're, that essentially they're tr trying to get us to, to, to take more time before we do definitive management, before we go in and do some sort of uh, surgical procedure. Uh, they, they, they're built into their protocol is a, is, a, is a waiting period, 72 hours, 72 hours. And I think you could probably, uh, probably make the, the, the argument that you could wait even longer and put in more drains and so on. I think that was well, uh, well, well presented previously. 
But eventually, if without clinical improvement, you, it leads to a vis video, th this approach leads to a video assisted retroperitoneal debridement. Now, what is that? So, uh, this uh, is a, a nice diagram of how to do this. Uh, essentially, it's done through a subcostal incision. In this particular patient, it's the left subcostal. Um, it, approximately five centimeter to six centimeter incision. Follow that down, uh, following the drain that was previously placed to uh, gain access to the retroperitoneal cavity. And, um, uh, and, and essentially do the debridement through there with the aid of a, some sort of uh, video device, either endoscope or a laparoscope uh, or uteroscope, whatever you, you have uh, at your disposal. So um, this step-up approach was found to reduce uh, new onset multiple organ failure and long-term complications such as diabetes and the need for pancreatic enzymes. So really, it is a, uh, it really is a, 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 a beneficial uh, procedure. Now, mortality is equivalent, but of course, this is a fairly small study, so not a, not, we can't really make, a, make a, co a comment on that at this point in time based on this study. But I would argue that the breakthrough of the step of approach was that the next step, the important next step was not the removal of, of necrosis, but rather the control of sepsis. And I think that this has been reiterated multiple times. And also it allowed to delay surgery. And I'm just gonna talk about uh, timing of surgery a little bit because really the, this is something that, that is, I, I find really striking is that the independent prognostic factors uh, for severe pancreatitis are multi-organ failure, which makes sense, high Apache 2 score also makes sense, but also early surgical intervention is an independent progno poor prognostic factor for, uh, for se severe acute pancreatitis. So really, the, this, this should really, I think, of course, all these studies do have some selection bias based on uh, those who are operated early versus late, but in the end, I think that we all should know this, that we have to wait as long as we possibly can before we do some sort of surgical procedure on these patients. And of course, with the delay in surgery, there's a clear demarcation, there's better long-term endocrine and exocrine function, function, and a reduction in post-operative adverse events. <clears throat> this is a systematic review. Um, done um, uh, quite recently in 2017. Uh, they essentially uh, stratified patients uh, based on for early and late. Now the co complication of this is that a lot of studies will use early and late, it would never use different time points for this. So what they decided was to separate into three different groups. Less than 72 hours, greater than 72 hours. Less than 12 days, greater than 12 days. Less than 30 days, greater than 30 days. So in all of these time points, Delayed surgery was always beneficial, always beneficial in terms of, and this is for mortality. So I think that this really reiterates, just iterates how important it is to delay surgery as much as possible. Keeping in mind, of course, that there is a, a bit of a selection bias here. This is, these are not randomized controlled trials here. They also found in this particular trial that uh, percutaneous endoscopic drainage was effective in delaying surgery and sometimes obviating the need for surgery and then that MIS, and o MIS was beneficial to open uh, decreasing morbidity and mortality, something that we've seen in other studies. Now, switching to transgastric necrosectomy, now the, 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 the vast, vast majority of the evidence of the studies that are out there are endoscopic transgastric necrosectomy. And all of these studies here um, compare essentially transgastric, endoscopic transgastric necrosectomy versus surgical necrosectomy. Now, the first one is, it's interesting, is a randomized trial published in 2012, but it is of only 10 patients per group. And in the surgical group, six of, only six of them had VARD, four of them had open necrosectomy. So it's very difficult to make a, different, to make a, a good comparison of the two. However, they did show that uh, the composite endpoint much, was, was much lower in an endoscopic group. That being said, their composite endpoint in the surgical group was 80%, which is much higher than the reported literature. Therefore, it kind of comes, it brings into question how, uh, how good their, their, their patient selection was. And then the other two studies are essentially compare open, sur open surgery versus uh, endoscopic in necrosectomy. And without, without being too shocked, it's, uh, it shows that the endoscopic, uh, endoscopic group has much lower complication rates uh, than the open surgery groups. Two, the, the numbers are all too small to really comment on mortality. There has been a Cochrane review on this. Um, there, the, keeping in mind that all of the evidence is of low quality, low or very low quality, but they do recommend, they do mention that, that the MIS, the step-up approach does have improved in terms of out, uh, severe outcomes and mortality versus the open group, and that the endoscopic group, although this is also very low 
quality is better than the, uh, the endoscopic group has, has lower adverse events than the surgical, i.e. the VARD step up group. But it's still, as I, I, I'm trying to get to here, the, the evidence is not exactly robust at this point in time, and that's why we're waiting for this, uh, this trial, the tension trial, which uh, currently ongoing in the Netherlands, which is going to, it's a randomized trial of endoscopic versus VARD step up. Endoscopic meaning the first drain will be placed endoscopically and moved up from there versus the surgical percutaneous drain stepped up to a, an open surgical uh, necrosectomy. So I think that we can say that transgastric necrosectomy is good when for, for walled off necrosis with a mature capsule in a retrogastric position. Um, and how about laparoscopic? Uh, like I said, there's not a lot of evidence out there for laparoscopic transgastric necrosectomy. Although, to be honest with you, this, uh, this is the, the approach that I have used uh, a little more, more frequently because we don't really, because this, this speaks to the, what we have at our, what your, your local expertise and your availability at your center, my center, the, endosco the endosco endoscopists don't perform transgastric necrosectomies. So we have adapted this to use laparoscopic, the laparoscopic approach uh, more frequently. One such patient is this guy here, 53-year-old um, guy who presented, transferred from Ireland uh, with severe acute pancreatitis, had a two or three day course in ICU over there and was transferred to our hospital pretty immediately. And he was pretty sick um, on, uh, on pressors and started on, on antibiotics. We wanted to do a, uh, a percutaneous approach, but we were told that the left uh, retroperitoneal approach was not accessible, and in fact, the patient actually improved clinically, and was actually transferred to the floor shortly thereafter with enteral feeding and antibiotics. So here we are uh, with this guy, and of course, as we've learned, it might be best to not do anything for him, but he continued to have uh, septic, um, uh, a septic clinical picture in spite of the antibiotics, and therefore, at about six weeks after his presentation, we took him for a laparoscopic uh, transgastric necrosectomy, which through an antrogastrotomy, uh, stapled, uh, triangular stapled uh, necros um, uh, connection was made between the, the pancreatic collection and the posterior wall of the stomach. As you can see, this is about a month later, the, 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 the collection is almost completely gone, and a month after that, it was, it was gone altogether. So, I think that what I'd like to just point out is that we have a heterogeneous patient population. It's, this is a complicating factor when discussing all of these various approaches. There's no single, I can't, I can't argue that there's a single therapeutic intervention that is definitely better for all patients, and it's best to be multimodal and adaptable. So what we're trying to achieve, I think that this, this is coming over again, is we want to postpone, and sometimes indefinitely, the need for surgery. The step-up approach is designed to push surgery past 30 days, and it's, it's possible that the benefit seen is due to the surgical timing rather than the operative approach, although I don't really think it's the case. But no surgical approach, is, no single approach is optimal for all patients, and I think you need to be aware of what, the, what other pro approaches there are to, uh, to, better, to better treat them. Thank you very much.